Hi guys, I'm Tyne Mercer and welcome to our channel. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be releasing our documentary series where I'm interviewing some of the most successful people across Ireland. And these are going to be people across different fields, across music, across video, across a movie production, different artists in different fields, business owners. And the whole aim of this is to take some of their skills, their journeys, their experiences and transition it into our own lives and skills that we can use to help us overcome our daily challenges to live better and more fulfilling lives as well and learning from them what it takes to live out your dreams. Let's get over to the channel. Hi guys, welcome to our series of documentary interviews that we're going to be doing with some of Ireland's high profile individuals and today we've got an absolutely special one. Um, I'm sitting down here with Irish actor, celebrity actor um, and film producer John Connors. John, how are you? Good man, good, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's my absolute pleasure um, and I know we got to catch up beforehand but I think the reason that I brought you on is to get a bit of content from yourself, um, information that will help the younger generation in our community in Ireland that are coming up to be in better positions. Mm to go and do better things for themselves. Yeah. Um, and be inspired, I think we all draw inspiration from different people in different ways. Film is something that I've always drawn inspiration on in my personal life. Um, so with that being said, you know, tell, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, I think. How did you first get into, into acting and writing films? Well, mm, let me go way back. Yeah. Let me take it way <laughs> back. Um, I was born in London. Right. Uh, a fact that my two brothers still slag me over to this day, <laughs> calling me English and all that. But uh, I was born there because my mother and father were engaged yeah. for two and a half years, like travellers would have these long engagements. Yeah. And they were engaged since they're like 16 or 15 or whatever. And my father, one night while he was drunk, my father was mentally ill, yeah. he, um, he had schizophrenia. He hijacked a car, a taxi, right. and he crashed it and broke his hip. And he got put on armed guard in the hospital. And my mother went in and escaped him out the window and he escaped to London. And I was born in London for that reason. Oh, wow. And then I came back to London and uh, living in basically around Kulak yeah. all my life. And my introduction to films would have been with my father. He, would, he was a mad film freak, you know. Yeah. And he loved all the kind of action films, the Steven Seagal's and Van Damme's and Bruce Lee's and all yeah. that kind of stuff. And they were, would have been the first films I really got into. And then... I would have got into a lot of the westerns for me grandfather loved westerns so yeah. I would have got into a lot of westerns and then my father passed away through suicide when I was eight and uh, I suppose he was the fellow that introduced me all to films and brought me to the cinema first time I remember watching the first film I ever saw was Space Jam yeah. and I just remember going wow this is fucking unbelievable like yeah. and so I had a love for films all my life but I never uh, I never thought that I was going to be I never th thought of being an actor right. like that's like being a traveller from Kulak saying you want to be an actor. Yeah. I wouldn't even think I wouldn't even think about it. And then when I was 16, I joined the FOSS course and uh, it was like m uh, mechanics and stuff. And I only literally did it just so people would, for, you know, just for optics, people would see me doing yeah. something and doing something manly. Yeah. Now, mind you, I didn't fucking do nothing and I'd only fucking play ping pong every day. You know <laughs> yeah. what I mean? But eventually, I, I, uh, this acting class started up. It was a six week course. And I fell in love with acting, but I didn't think about, again, didn't think about acting. Yeah. And then a few years went by, and I had boxed from a young age and won three Irish titles and four nation gold medal, multi nations, all that kind of stuff I was in. And I kind of ran out of options in life and I got really depressed and at one point was going to kill myself. Right. And my brother Joe reached out to me and uh, said, literally asked me, are you going to kill yourself? It was this weird moment, you know? And uh, I said no, but I gave him an indication that I was going to, yeah. because I wanted to speak. So we talked for hours, and by the end of it he said, look, you love cinema so much, you, you know everything about fucking cinema and films yeah. and that, why don't you try acting? And the reason why it was the perfect idea in that moment is because I, I stopped caring what other people thought, because I was so down. Yeah. Why the fuck would I care what anybody thought, yeah. you know? So I tried, um, I tried, uh, Get, I got in touch with the Abbey, 
Now, no association with the Abbey Theatre or the Abbey School at the time, but yeah. it was just on Abbey Street. And I called this woman who was the head of it called Kathleen Warner Yates. And I said, look, I'm looking to do some acting. In that moment, like Joe grabbed the laptop. So um, she said, have you ever acted before? And I said, no, not really. I did a little course when I was like 16 and whatever. Yeah. She said, there's a scene study course, but it's for professional actors and people who've been doing it for years or whatever. Yeah. And I said, I'll do that. And she says, well, you, you know, you, know you, you might not be ready for that. And I said, look, I'll just do that. And so I borrowed, I think, 200 quid off my uncle and 50 euro off my brother Joe. And I think I had the other 50 myself. And yeah. I borrowed the last five euro from my mother to get the bus in and out. This was 10 years ago, so the bus would have been about 250 that time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I went into the class and everybody gathered around the circle yeah. and everybody did an introduction to, to themselves and what they had done. And they all were professional actors working in theatre and film and television. And uh, it came around to me and I said, you know, I've never really done anything. And it was like, eh, eh, kind of laughs and whatever. And I said, oh, fuck. Yeah. I'm, I'm fucked now. Like. <laughs> and I just thought to myself, I need to get out of here. So the first opportunity, I was going to, like, escape. Yeah. And uh, they set up an improv game and it was about a shopkeeper and a customer. Yeah. So the customer would walk outside the door and he'd walk in and the shopkeeper would have to go along with what the customer said. Yeah. It's a typical impro improvisational game. And um, so the lad who went out was a who was playing the customer was this Dublin lad from a, a very posh background, you know. And the cust the shopkeeper was a Brazilian man of color, a black man. Yeah. Okay. Not important to me, but it is for the story. Yeah. So the customer walks in, walks through the door, and he starts saying it's a protein shop, and he's getting this that, and the other. But he ends up being very patronising. Yeah. Your man had poor English. And then, to me, racist. Now, depression and anger are like Siamese twins, yeah. and you kind of switch from one to the other. Yeah. Now, I, could, I just seen a man in front of me being discriminated against, and it reminded me of all the discrimination I went through in my life. Yeah. So, I volunteered to be in the game because the Dublin lad had now become the, the shopkeeper, yeah. so they needed a customer. So, I volunteered. Put him on the spot. And I walked outside. And when I was walking outside, I said, will I go now, will I go now? Because I was so terrified of doing it, you yeah. know? But uh, I had an idea, so I, w I opened up the door and I ran through and I robbed the place in the game, like. Yeah. And I slapped your man around, the Dublin fella, gave him two slaps, and I took off his shoes and his socks. Yeah. And I was halfway taking off his trousers when the <laughs> teacher stepped in, John, John, please stop, stop! <laughs> so I ran out of the class, yeah. and I ran down two, two flights of stairs, ran down the Abbey Road, and she ran after me and said, John, come back, come back, come back. And I said, why, you're not going to call the guards, are you? Yeah. And she says, no, no, that was fucking crazy, but it was, it was exciting and blah, blah, blah. And she said, come back up. So I went back up and uh, kind of a lukewarm clap from everybody, kind of out of fear yeah. of some of them. Yeah. And uh, I did that course, that was about 10 weeks. And uh, yeah, things just started kicking off really after that. It was when I, I actually made a conscious decision to start thinking positive yeah. and start actually being positive because when you think negatively, you'll just attract negativity yeah. all the time and you'll find yourself in negative situations with negative people. Yeah. And when you do positive, it's the same. And it's the world and the universe works in a fucking strange, serendipitous way when you just start thinking positive, you know? Yeah. So that was the start That was the start of it all then, just how I got into acting and fell in love with it. And that was the key, I fell in love with something. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, because previously you'd be passing was boxing which I just grew out of. Right. And listen, it's hard to fucking love getting punched in the head. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like, Although I did for yeah. a long time love it. But that became the new love and the new passion. Creativity in general, you know, yeah. anything creative is, is what I love doing. Yeah. You talked about two key things and I think that, that's why I brought you on this to have mm. the chat. One of them was discrimination, the other was the step that you went through, the dark phase of suicide. Mm. Um, I went through it myself, mm. but I speak to a lot of young people now that are going through the same thing. Um, especially early early teens, like sorry, early twenties, they're going through that. Once they hit that eighteen phase, they're going through that. Mm. Now I'm coaching a young kid who's currently going through depression, um, and they're on antidepressants because life loses that colour. What what advice? I suppose not even advice. Like what what changed in that moment for you, or what causes you to be in that sort of rut? When you lose hope, yeah, you need hope. So. You need meaning, right? And you need purpose, and you need passion, yeah. right? 
meaning, purpose, passion. Um, Victor, I think it's Stelgard, he was a, I think it's Victor Stelgard, he was a psychologist who went through the Holocaust yeah. and he was in Auschwitz and he did therapy with, with everyone in Auschwitz. Yeah. Right? And um, he did a study, he was there for a few years and he studied and he did a book about it and it was about the people who survived and how they survived and what you need to survive a dire situation like that. Yeah. And it's the meaning, purpose and passion. Yeah. So find out what something means to you, find that purpose that drives that and then the passion for to do that. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And that's, it all came together with acting for me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because I get that, that sense of self, that identity, that spirituality, mm. that meaning from it. Yeah. Because that the creativity is spiritual. You know? And some of the best nights of my life and spiritual profound moments of my life was when I'm on stage or particularly on stage rather than film, it's not necessarily, it's a different thing, but they're both great yeah. in different ways. So having that and then I just threw all the eggs in one basket like when I did that, when I found acting, you know, because people say I get a you know, second option or third option or whatever. And I think if you have a second or third option, you're going to go to them, like, you know. Yeah. So I was like, this is it. That's it now, the going all the way. Yeah. Yeah. And crazy shit started happening. Like, um, I, I heard about this audition for a film, King of the Travelers, which was my first film. Yeah. Auditioned for it, and um, the, blew the director away. He couldn't yeah. believe how good I was. This is a traveler actor, and it was a traveler film, so it was perfect. And then he ended up getting a lead in that film, and just kind of started spitballing. And I ended up writing another feature with yeah. that director. We met that. I played the lead in that, and. Um, then on, in Galway Film Flat in 2013, 2012, um, the Love Hate writer uh, saw both of those films back to back. Yeah. And I'd done a, a little special extra spot, spot in Love Hate a couple of years before. He never met me. And he just came to me, I'd love to bring that character back yeah. and develop after seeing these films. All these, all these things just start happening yeah. from just simply going, I'm going to do something good in life. You know, I, yeah. I, I want to do something good with my life. I don't want me. I don't want to waste my life or waste any potential I, I, I might have. Because how long is this for? Like, yeah. you're lucky you live till 80 years of age or whatever, and you're dead, you're dead forever. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just so short, it's so short. That's why you hate seeing fucking wasted talent. Like, True. I hate it. True. Untapped talent and unwasted talent. Yeah. Uh, it's a horrible thing, like, because it's beautiful to see people fulfill their potential, you yeah. know what I mean? And that, see, that's one of the key things that, why I do what I do, is because I see a lot of that. I'm growing up, I'm playing football here in Talla, playing football all across Ireland. And you do come up against some incredible talented players and stuff like that. But when you watch them a couple of years down the line, completely deteriorated. Alcohol all the time, they're in the pubs 24-7. And they're too young to be at that. Yeah. Um, so which is a tough one. It is really a tough one. But one of the key things that you did mention when you were talking about yourself is you stopped caring what people thought about you, what people were looking at. Yeah. A lot of the decisions we make is based on that. Yeah. I did the same. I went to college for two years based on that and I hated it. Yeah. But it was to please my parents because of fear of what people would consider me as a failure. But the, the strange thing, and that's why I always encourage the young people, like pursue what you want to pursue. Don't necessarily follow people's opinion because you might fail the first year or two, but eventually you start winning. Yeah. And I was in a similar case where I dropped out of college and I was on the dole for two years. Nothing happening at all until a couple of years later I started getting opportunities and doors started opening up. Long story short, sitting here with you. Yeah. Um, so it works that way, but you also mentioned one thing, and this is what I wanted to touch base on. I think the discrimination that travelers face, I've grown up in Ireland all my life. I faced it, you know, my friends, when we see a traveler come into the Astros, like, oh boys, you have to get out of here. You know, mm. one of my close friends was a traveler growing up, yeah. and whenever he came into the Astros to play ball, all the guys would run out. Mm. And I remember one day in particular, one of the lads left his ball in there and they came in, uh, Christopher Moore, and he asked me and he goes, let's play a game. Christopher Moore? Yeah. Christopher Moore's my cousin. Is he? Yeah. From Tala? Yeah. 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 Growing up, he used to play football with us it's in St. Mark's Astro. That's fucking gas, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So Christopher's he, about 29 now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so he came into the Astro. And he's like, let's play ball, lads. And I'm like, yeah, let's play a game. Yeah. We were playing a game of uh, World Cup. <laughs> yeah. But all the boys all said, no, no, I have to go for lunch. I have to go for this. But it was that fear factor. Yeah. And that stigma. That and you around. knew, you knew, because you went through it. Oh, a million percent. Yeah. Yeah. A million percent. And yeah. I know him, so it was no bother to me. Yeah, let's yeah. play a game. Yeah. Like, I do see that, travellers, there's a bit of aggression and physicality, but yeah. you need that. That's yeah, normal. Yeah. Um, 
Anybody, any people who have, you know, we've been in a war of attrition. Yeah. That's what travelers have been going through in this country. Like, And a lot of people who discriminate against travelers actually have no context for the situation we're in. They don't know anything about our history or culture, but particularly our history with this state, with the mm. Irish state. Like, like the 1963 report on itinerancy was headed by Charlie High, who yeah. later became the T-shirt. Now, in that, Charlie High, at, on this commission, was his objective was um, to look for the final solution to the itinerant problem. They called this itinerant then. Final solution, where do we hear that before Nazi Germany? Yeah. Hitler was looking for the final solution to the Jewish problem. Yeah. He said, we're looking for the final solution to the itinerant problem. There were suggestions made in that report by politicians, by uh, voted in ministers, councillors, yeah. to castrate traveller men or to sterilise the women or to put them all out in Spike Island and breed out. And then there was loads of ramifications from that commission yeah. that was implemented in policy. And it was all about the eradication of our culture and our nomadism yeah. and our language and all that stuff. So people like to go X, Y and Z with travellers, but you don't want to have a context of it. Yeah. Yet if, if you were to look anywhere across the world and you point to a certain people, you can see their history and the history and the harsh history that they went through and how yeah. it, is a, it, it affects them to this day. It shapes them to how they are. Yeah, now, yeah, but you don't want to apply that logic when it comes to travellers. Mm. You know what I mean? So, but, but the thing is, man, look, I've faced discrimination all my life. I've been beaten to a pulp because people, fellas calling me knacker one night, asked me for a smoke, heard my accent. Oh, you must be a knacker, are you? And I just, but I said, fuck you, whatever. Loads yeah. of black me. I've had all this in school being called knacker and pikey by teachers. Yeah. I've had it all. And the reality is, reality is it's tough. It sets up more barriers for sure, yeah. yeah, but if you're a victim of oppression, of discrimination, fine, recognize you are, use it as fuel, yeah. but don't adopt the victim mentality. Yeah. Because the victim mentality will destroy you, because actually only you can stop yeah. you. No one can stop you, a million percent. you know what I mean? And I hear it with a lot of young travelers who have lost hope, and it's just, what's the point? Like, we're never gonna get anywhere. Yeah. Well, you're definitely never gonna get anywhere if you're not gonna try. Yeah. You're definitely not, that's a fact. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I think I, I think a big part of that, right? And, and I, as I always say, media plays a big part in that. Mm, big time. Um, education plays a factor yeah. in the schooling. When you're talking about discrimination, there's barely anything done on discrimination or anything like that. Sure. And a lack of understanding, like conversations. I, my thing has always been this: before I judge somebody, I have to sit down with them and know about them. Hundred percent. Before I judge any culture, any race, yeah. I need to sit down. Even from my African culture, there is a lot of stereotype and racism towards other African countries yeah, yeah. and other cultures, yeah. travelers, white people, all of it. Yeah. Um, but where I, what I discovered recently, I was having a conversation with one of my friends and I was describing what racism feels like to him. And he told, and he explained to me what it feels like when the guards treat him as a scumbag because he's from Jonestown. Yeah, that's and, classism, yeah. And I literally stopped real. and I was like, that's exactly how racism feels. And he told me, yeah, well, that's similar to how I feel. And when I look across and I'm like, I've always talked about it, people that get discriminated don't get talked about. Gay people get discriminated, travellers get treated just as bad as black people get treated mm -hmm. um, in a lot of places. Yeah. There's a fear factor for different reasons. But I think where people fall short is, and where I find beauty and what the travellers stand for, is these are more, I think it's family focused. Like I die for my family. That's the type of mentality travellers have. Absolutely. That I've come across. And a lot of travellers that I've come across know their identity and they're quite, they're quite strong in terms of what being a traveller represents for them. I don't yeah. know if you'd agree with me on that. No, absolutely, man, but that's down to having to survive something. Yeah. So, like, you're growing up, you're essentially uh, be, being considered a problem. Yeah. And then when you're considered a problem, you become a problem solver. Yeah. And then you have to be proud about who you are because you're in a war of attrition in which your culture is being eradicated. So what are you going to do? You're going to stand up and fight and you're going to say, I'm so proud yeah. to be who I am like. Yeah. And that thing of, like with travellers, with um, like things like with bare knuckle fighting and things like that, that's a self-policing thing that gets misconstrued. Right. You know, like we couldn't depend on the Irish police on Garda Shia Khan, so we policed ourselves. Yeah. And I would never condemn that. I'm not going to go, oh yeah, um, I, I disagree with you. I think it's all scum. No. I think two fellas going to have a punch in the face of each other to set the argument is beautiful. That's what, I've done it, you know what I mean? I, yeah. I can't sit here and say I haven't. I've done it many times. Proud that I never lost, yeah. you know what I mean? And nice. that's a part of my culture. And we love it. And that's our, it's, kind of, it's a sport too, in a way. 
But uh, so they, they are some of the things that get thrown at you, and and you're expected to kind of condemn them. No, I won't condemn them. Things like feuding when two big families come against each other or something yeah. like that. I condemn that, of course, because that's extreme violence, and yeah. people are getting really hurt. Like, you know what I mean? But going out getting a fucking black eye or yeah. losing the tooth or something, who cares? Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's fucking. It's only a fight. And there is, so we are reared with that mentality. There is, we do have a fighting culture. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, sure, if you look at, since the year 2000, like Ireland, the boxing team of Ireland has, has been in the top 10 best countries in the world, yeah. right? I, I spent a lot of that time in the top five, actually. And every other country in the top 10 has at least 10 times the, uh, the population of Ireland, right? right? So it says a lot about the fighting Irish sentiment that you hear, right? Yeah. It says a lot. It's impressive. Now, if you, if you wire that down even and look at it even deeper, travellers make up 0.6% of the Irish population, so just over a half of 1%. Yeah. Uh, and yet, we make up about 50% of the Irish champions, right? The majority of national world senior medals that have been won since the year 2000 yeah. have been won by travellers uh, on a senior level. So that's a quite amazing statistic. Yeah. And that's a cultural thing. It just comes from a young age, having to stand up and fight for yourself. You have to fight. Yeah. And, and listen, that doesn't mean every traveler you ever meet is a good fighter either. True, true. But, but nearly everyone will fight you. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because not every, everybody, there's a place in the tribe for everybody. Yeah. Not everybody is a good fighter. Not everybody is good at this. Not a, true. Everybody has different skills. You know yeah. what I mean? And some people are just natural born killers. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I think, like, when I look at travellers, and I think from a lot of people, it comes from a fear factor. I think it's fear. That's yeah. where a lot of yeah. racism and misunderstanding sure. comes from. It's fear. Yeah. And you may see in somebody other qualities that you don't have yourself. Yeah. I think from a lot of us looking, and even me looking in, I'd look at travellers and I'm like, they're fearless. Mm. Um, now, it is scary to yeah. be in the presence of somebody who's willing to go 10, 10 more steps than you can ever go. Yeah. Um, if a situation breaks out on altercation. Yeah. But at the same time as well, a saying that I heard from Jordan Peterson, mm. you know, the most trustworthy men are the dangerous ones. Yeah, geez, Dangerous cool. men are trustworthy men because mm. if somebody's integrated with, let's say, the dark side of themselves and yeah, the shadow. their shadow yeah. and that aggression, but they integrate mm. that yeah. and they control it themselves, that's a man who For sure. should be respected or a man who is, is safe as opposed to somebody who's weak and doesn't know how yeah. strong they could ever be. They seem to do the most. And why they're trustworthy and why, he, well, what he's getting to is if you know the dark side of you and you know what you're capable of yeah. and then you don't do it, that's where your morality comes from. Yeah. That's where your values come from. That's yeah. what Jordan Peterson actually talks about because I'm into Jordan Peterson too. And it's an interesting concept, the shadow. Yeah. Because the thing of not getting to know your shadow or denying your shadow it goes back to the Lacanian saying, it, what isn't said becomes a symptom. Yeah. So if you think about that, fuck, what isn't said becomes a symptom, because he was anti-repression. And it's similar to the shadow thing. Whatever you repress will come out in catastrophic behavior. And you can't control it then. And, it can, and it's got, that's it, it's just flowing like a tap, you know? So we need to connect our traumas and our experiences with our bad behavior yeah. Yeah. and understand that's what it's coming from. Yeah. What isn't said becomes a symptom. Talk about it all, get it all out. Because yeah. if you don't, it will consume you. A million percent. You know, and that's what happens when people go on fucking killing sprees and yeah. suicide and whatever it is. Or, you know, I grew up in Darndale, which is, you know, a drug... Tough area. It's a tough, tough area, yeah. like, and it's drug ridden and all that stuff. And I've um, seen mad shit, involved in mad shit as a younger, fighting every day. And you see a lot of repressed people who don't talk about what's actually going on. Yeah. Don't talk about the fact that they were grew up with a heroin addict mother and father, or that they were sexually abused or physically abused. And then they have the perfect attributes to be a gangster then, because yeah. they've repressed everything and they lead with their fucking psychotic self and they don't give a fuck. Yeah. They don't give a fuck to the point where they don't care if they die. Yeah. And they, they're very dangerous people, you know? And it's, it's, it's all about repression, man. We have to start with that conversation, talking to each other, communicating yeah. to each other. Because things with depression and, and trauma and all that, when you fucking hide that shit, it's, that secret has a hold over you. Yeah. You know what I mean? And once you start sharing it, it's like, it's like it's the, a huge the, relief. It's a huge relief. It's yeah. like the fucking the cliche, a problem, share, a problem shared is a problem halved. Yeah. You know what I mean? It really is like, but if you keep it to yourself, it's there in the back of your mind. It's floating around your unconscious. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it eventually comes to the forefront. Yeah. And it comes to the forefront in all those hardest moments. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's like, you know, it's why people go to drugs and go to alcohol and 
you know, they're, you're three day in a vendor then and you're gone and you're gone. That voice is louder now. Yeah. That voice is coming right now because now I'm at my weakest. I'm yeah. gonna be I'm gonna be looking at the ceiling now for the night and that voice is gonna be roaring in my fucking face. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you just have to get all that stuff out, man. It's the only thing to do because like, people will look after other aspects of themselves. But when it comes to mental health and mental illness, it's weird how we look at it. Because if I wouldn't ask Blake here to lift something heavy if he had a broken arm, mm. right? But yet we turn around and say, you act normal when you're depressed. Yeah. It's the same thing. Yeah. And it's because depression and mental health is invisible. You know what I mean? Can't see it. And we just really have to look at it differently, you know? Yeah. And you're, you're a million percent why I'm, I'm agreeing with a lot of what you're saying, because I know the feeling. I've gone through it. Yeah. I've gone through it in different parts yeah. of even this year. We're exactly what you're talking about in your weakest moment, things that you hold back. Um, and that just, it could be one thing that just happens that day and yeah. all of a sudden all of those thoughts flow back in. And that's where a lot of young men are lost right now. Big time. I think a lot of people in this country, with everything that's gone on, the pandemic, yeah. being locked in, all of that has done that to people. So a lot of the medical professionals, or not even medical professionals, but the resources that are out there, I think are limited and they're not explored to the way that you're describing it here. Yeah, um, which no, is valuable. Absolutely not, and it's and the culture within this country because we're still, you know, to if still we're still dealing with things that has happened in the past, and we, even though Ireland has this sort of like it's like a pretend liberal shine, yeah. you know, they're not really because we're still fucking so repressed, yeah. and, and people are still repressed from the Catholic Church and things that happen. Like we're in a country, we're a country where people don't talk. Yeah, they don't talk. Like they talk when they drink. That's it. That's exactly it. Yeah. So the other, the other side of the conversation then, John, what I wanted to touch base on you, because obviously you're successful in your career right now mm. and you're working on doing bigger and better things. Um, for young people wanting to start off in a position of pursuing their dream, I know it's one thing to say, yes, you don't care and you just take that initial step and go and do it. But how can you advise somebody on getting to high levels of success? Not just chasing small goals, because my thing is, there's a lot of people that chase small goals because it looks popular and it looks good, but there's very few people that are pursuing passion, they're pursuing their dreams, and pursuing things that bring that color out of life, essentially, as you mentioned yourself. Um, how can we transition into those steps? Because you're somebody who's gone through the dark side and now you're where you are today. First of all, man, I think it's pointless if you're not passionate about it. Yeah. So if you're motivated by anything other than being passionate about it, you're not going to succeed anyway. Yeah. That's, I think that's the reality of it. You know, because we, we, do, we are living in a generation now where people are fucking, you know, with Instagram and influencer kind of culture and all that, people are pursuing things that they're not as passionate about, you know? Yeah. So you need to find it first of all. And if you're passionate about it, I think you'll go all the way. Yeah. You know, what's important is to, like, you know, you look at the acting industry and you look at that kind of industry and what I kind of identified uh, what's, what was a big problem was you are waiting for someone else to give you a yes. Yeah. So someone controls your destiny. So they have your destiny in their hand when you walk into that audition room. Yeah. And they can say yes or no, and that could put your career on the trajectory, or it could bring you back this way, yeah. right? <clears throat> but just walking in that room. And I went, you know what? I'm not, I'm not comfortable with that. Yeah. No, 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 no. My career is not going to be in someone else's hand, particularly because I stood up for certain stuff and politically and spoke in certain ways that a lot of people didn't like yeah. me, you know. And then I'm the only real traveler in the fucking industry, or was up until recently, along yeah. with Michael Collins, who was the first. And it's all that st disadvantages I did have. A lot of people just, you know, because in the film as you come from a very posh background, so. They just feel uncomfortable talking to a traveler. It's like what you yeah. said a while ago, you know? So that kind of stuff. So I said, I'm not, I'm not happy with it, with it being in other people's hands. So I said, what I have to do is essentially um, become bigger than the room. Yeah. It's what Jim Sheridan told me. Jim Sheridan was a six-time Oscar nominee. I worked with him um, on his film, The Secret, Secret Scripture, and he said, you have to become bigger than the room. Yeah. So the opportunity to come up um, to form a business with my business partner, Karen Williams, and we yeah. created a company, Cluster Fox Films, and. We, our first film that we did uh, won the audience award, a diff, and every film won the audience award a diff in the last five years, either won or, went, won or went on to be nominated for an Oscar. Amazing. And we did it for nothing, that film. And we just finished our first drama, uh, The Black Wealth, it's called. 
and that's about what we're talking about repression and stuff and uh, we've done loads of shorts and stuff yeah. and now my career is in my hands mm. because I identified a problem and the problem was that other people control my destiny so yeah. what do you do um, you have to ask yourself that question what do you do in order for, so you can fucking control it like what yeah. how do you grab a hold of your career and then you can't stop like that's the thing and you have to sacrifice things yeah. you know what I mean and you have to say no and you have to make the right choices we were just talking a yeah. while ago before that you get confronted with choices day in day out like yeah. what choice do you take like you know what I mean it's like I got rid of my smartphone three months ago because I couldn't fucking write mm. you know what I mean I was too distracted by it yeah. It's too many distractions for everything, so I said I have to get rid of that. So I started writing more, yeah. and I hit all my deadlines for my latest film that I'm doing, a travel film, which I'm shooting next year. So it's about fucking making the right choices, identifying what you want, and how you grab your own destiny and put it in your own hands. Yeah. And then don't stop, don't take no for an answer. Jump over the barriers. If you're someone that comes from a background similar to us, yeah. and you have those barriers, jump over the barriers. Realize they're just barriers. Mm. Don't just make that as an excuse as to why you didn't make it. Because right. that's not good enough. Yeah. Because you never really wanted it anyway. Yeah. And if you have more barriers, that'll mean you'll even be better than the person opposite you. When you get there. Because you've got over yeah. all of them. You yeah. got over them. Like, and you fucking problem solved, problem solved, problem solved. Because that's what it's all about. You're getting presented with problems all the time. Yeah. And you either panic or you solve them. Yeah. And take your time. And that's it. And just you can't stop. You yeah. know what I mean? And that's refreshing because <clears throat> when a lot of people watch this, and even me, prior to us sitting mm. down and having the conversation, I'd be thinking, you've had a smooth journey. Mm. You know what I mean? Maybe it's just one day or you went to drama school and one day you decided, yeah, I'm going to start a career in acting and you got it. People don't see the hurdles. And it's refreshing to see because you see people on different scales. Tyson Fury talks about it, what he had to go through. Every mm. other champion, world champion out there talks sure. about it. I'm big into the boxing side. And when I'm listening to it from yourself, and I know my own journeys, I've had hurdles too. Yeah things that I've had to overcome. There's periods where I did stop before on yeah. other things that I was doing, which I should have probably pushed through. But then mm -hmm. I learned from that and I did it in other areas. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of young people that are going through that right now. So similar to what John said, if you're in that situation, that position that you were, there was barriers before you. It's not necessarily a sign for you to stop. Yeah. Maybe just reinvent the wheel. Exactly. Change the game plan a little bit. And there's an opportunities when you're confronted with a problem, there's an opportunity to grow and learn. Yeah. And if you take the same concept and you look at trauma, trauma can make a person or break a person. Like yeah. Some of the most talented and creative people alive are people who, who suffered from severe trauma. Big time. And were able to overcome the trauma. So you can have post-traumatic growth from it or post-traumatic stress disorder, yeah. PTSD as is known. So there's that, always that opportunity where you're confronted with trauma and a bad event to make or break you, to destroy you or make you. Yeah. And it's how you view the fucking thing. Okay. And you have, to, you have to have the right mentality and go, right, you have to bring logic into it and go, I'm going to get over this. Yeah. I'm going to learn from this. See, this pain, this pain is going to create something beautiful. Yeah. It's going to create something special, you know? Nice. Like I'm in the Abbey right now and I'm doing rehearsals and... I'm, uh, I've, I've grown so much as an actor, I'm only realised it. I'm yeah. on the stage and I'm with this. I'm doing, I have this really tough material, really fucking tough. And I'm playing a fella who commits suicide, yeah. right? Which was what happened with my father. Yeah. And I'm realising that all the emotion, all that stuff I can access now, but, but I'm realising this is a craft. It's about holding it back. Yeah. Holding it back and letting it out at the right time. And it's really challenging, but I'm, I'm going so much for the yeah. whole experience and life and art becomes intertwined. Yeah. You know what I mean? And Absolutely. one uses, you, one, you, you bounce off each other. Like this, this it's a strange serendipitous life. Yeah. And if you yeah. open your eyes up and you're open-minded, like things will happen that are just strange yeah. that you can't even explain. Yeah. And it's, I think it's the connection between science and religion that has yet to be figured out by science. <laughs> I think it will be one day. Yeah. You know what I mean? There is yeah. something else weird going on that you know there's there's a there is a a bit of faith there's something yeah. happening there's something happening that kind of alchemy um because i've had profound experiences in my life yeah. that are unexplained yeah. they cannot be explained you know what i mean and i've been saved a few times um, and, and taken out of really bad situations yeah. but, but it's about being open to all that and just keep going towards the goal like and the small goal thing is good and all that yeah. but i mean you know you need the big dream and yeah. just work work towards the big dream yeah. and do things that go towards that big dream but that drives you like that's, that's the shine that's of life exactly it. it stretches you yeah it gives life new color but you mentioned something on faith 
um, and I know part of traveler tradition, I think travelers are very much faith in terms of there's a strong faith, there's a yeah. belief in God, there's a belief in prayers and things like that. Has that mm. played a huge factor in your life? Yeah, uh, but not in, a, not in a really religious way. In, I believe in God, yeah. but I wouldn't be super religious, you know, but like by the Bible and by the scripture and yeah. all that. I would believe in God. There's no doubt mm. a God. There's no doubt a creator, yeah. a grand designer, no doubt. I, I don't, I know it. Yeah. I know what I don't believe it, I know it. Yeah. So that gives you hope in the dark times as well. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I think, sure, look, if you look at anybody who went through recovery or doing a 12 step program, a part of that is finding your God. Mm. So I think you need to have that. And whether that's ultra religious scripture, whatever kind of, or whatever God it is, but finding that thing, and it doesn't necessarily mean a fucking spirit or something yeah. so literal as that. But to me, that higher power, that grand designer, definitely exists yeah. and that is a great hope yeah. because you know we're all connected like yeah. we're all connected look look at what science tells us about energy essentially when we break a human being then we're made up of energy yeah. and when we die our physical body dies but our energy never dies yeah. that's a law of the universe mm. human en human energy will never die energy will never die it just transforms into a different form yeah but what yeah. does that sound like that sounds like a soul to me yeah do you know what i mean yeah. so there's hope there forever and i think that's very important to have and those dark times to have hope of something something bigger is at play yeah. now i would not believe in an all seeing all watching god that judges you all the time yeah. on this x y or z i think it's more of a grand designer that is outside there that created this place and we're all kind of left to our own devices yeah. that's what i believe yeah. you know and i think it's important to have something like that again hope is the most most important thing you can never give up hope give up hope it's like giving up your soul yeah. and yeah and then you go down the dark path like you know what I mean? You, you mentioned something there, and this is, I, I touch upon this a lot. Um, when I always talk about, I talk about lifestyle design. When mm -hmm. I reflect on the dark times that I went through and the times of prosperity and, you know, things are going well for me, mm -hmm. I always look at it as lifestyle design. Um, my father always used to tell me, and he always says this to me, there's two parts of this, um, which a lot of religious people fall short on understanding. There's a spiritual side of things. That world is unseen. You don't see that what takes place, but you can pray in the mornings and things like that, and God will hear the prayers that you speak. But He also leaves you to your own device. Mm. You just mentioned it there. He leaves you to live life the way you want to do. Make your own decisions. He would never open a door and walk through that door for you. It's your decision whether you pursue the things you pursue or not. And at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, we all get asked, what did you do with the time that you had mm. here yeah. that I gave to you? I yeah. was never part of me making the choices for you. That's why we have our own will. Yeah. Um, Jordan Peterson talks about it, again, I like him because he said this and I think it's important for young people to understand those who don't think they're in control of their own life. Mm. Jordan Peterson said it that, um, oh, what, what is the quote? It's going to come back to me. Oh. It's about free will, is it? it it's about versus, free will, yes. God, versus determinism. Exactly. God gave us the free will to choose against him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He gave that's you the ultimate good. power to even choose against him. Yeah, that's right. And good. that was probably one of the most dangerous things you could have done, but that's yeah. how much control that we have. We can still go yeah. against the creation that is ourselves. And so for young people that watch this, or anybody who's watching this in a dark period, I always like to say to people all the time, you have control over your life. Yeah. You have control of the things that happen a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, based on what you do today. Yeah. What you don't do, also has consequences as opposed to what you do. Absolutely. You yeah. do the negative things, it comes back long term. Well, you do more positive, things start happening for you, and as you mentioned yourself, somehow, some way, the world just connects the dots for you. It really you end does. up connecting with the right people um, in different and places. And man, like even like just when you're at your absolute, when you're at your absolute darkest and yeah. you're at the bottom, the only way is up. It really is. Yeah. And you're in that moment where you're in your room and you're in a box fucking room and you're in a room inside your fucking head too. Yeah. You think that nothing is gonna happen for your good and everything is bad and you're doomed and your soul is doomed and you're doomed and you'd rather be dead. The next morning, if you just wait, because you know, I've been to that place yeah. hundreds of times, the next morning you wake up, you're better. It doesn't mean you're matter, but next morning you go, oh, it does feel a bit better now, you know? Yeah. And it's every day, it just gets better. You just have to hang in there because that's where free will comes in. Yeah. Free will comes in and going, right, I'm going to get my shit together now yeah. and I'm going to ride this wave. Yeah. And it's fucking tough, but I'm not going to let it fucking destroy me. Like, it is very You know hard. what I mean? Like, yeah. It's tough, it's so tough. Yeah. But you have to learn from those experiences 
and realize I see when I get put into a dark situation now and I've had a, few, a rough couple of years what what helps me is that I know I've came back from it already yeah already you know and I've done it and I came back from that dark place so when I get confronted with something or something traumatic happens in my life or I lose somebody and I feel those feelings again I go you beat them before, yeah. you've conquered them before, yeah. you will get through this and you'll be stronger again and you'll learn more and you'll have greater humanity and compassion yeah. for yourself and for other people. Yeah. You, and you'll be in a better position to talk to people about this, about grief and about trauma, yeah. right? And I use it in my art then, you know what I mean? And yeah. then my pain and trauma becomes art, like all the greatest artists. That's what they, If you look at Richard Pryor and you look at the comedy of Richard Pryor, I think he's probably the greatest comedian of all time. Yeah. And if you look at what he jokes about, he's joking about his mother being a prostitute. Mm. He's joking about his mother getting raped. He's joking about all this mad shit. He's joking about smoking trauma. crack. Yeah. He's, you know what I mean? And he's making the whole world laugh. Yeah. He's turning something horrible into something beautiful. And all the great artists all did it. And that's what it's all about. And just tur turning oranges into orange juice. Yeah. And saying, I'm at the getting, I came back before, I learned. I know I'm full of anxiety right now and these things are going up along my chest and I think I'm fucking dying. Yeah. But tomorrow morning I will be better. I will be better tomorrow morning. Yeah. You know? That, that's amazing and it's refreshing because uh, I suppose there's a huge element of vulnerability there, mm. of letting go. Yeah. And it's hard to be, I, I don't know why, I don't think it is. It, mainly it's probably in our own mindset and our own beliefs that we're raised with that we think it's hard to be vulnerable as men. Um, but I find that now it's probably the best thing you can do and, and something that we should do all the time is be vulnerable and let go of that control. Um, but it's something that young men struggle with. Yeah, well, if you look at it from a young age, okay, you're four years of age, you're going to the park, your mother and father, whoever, and you fall on the ground, you cut your knee, you start crying, you get told, stop crying, you're yeah. a big boy now. Yeah. Right, the, the, this, that's important mm. from a young age, yeah. because the first seven years determines, first seven years of life determines your whole worldview. Okay. Okay, so that's formed by your seven. And it may not come out until you're older, but that's essentially formed. The first yeah. two years determines how you get along with people in terms of a relationship, whether it's romantic or platonic or sibling or whatever. Yeah. First two years, right? So you, th your brain is like an absolute sponge taking everything in at, at those ages. So you're being taught your ethics, you're being taught an ethos. And the ethos is, get up, you're a big boy now. Yeah. Okay, what that, what that says is, repress your emotions. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Or you get a kid, you're painting the house, and your kid, your your kid comes over and grabs the paintbrush and just starts splashing against the wall. I ah, stop doing that. Stop doing that. Yeah. Right? Stop being creative. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So you're being taught, and you know the parents don't know this. You mm. know what I mean? But you're being taught to repress your emotions yeah. from a young age, particularly men. So, and then it comes out in the catastrophic behaviours, in the fucking cocaine, yeah. in the drink at the weekend, and yeah. all that stuff. It all comes out. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because we can't, that stuff, trauma, trauma comes to collect. Okay. That's the thing. It comes to collect. It's going to collect one day. Yeah. You're not running away from it forever. You have to address it because yeah. it's going to come back to get you and it's going to bite you. You know what I mean? Yeah. But from a young age, that's what you're getting taught. And then from me, when I get into acting, it, for me, it was about deconstructing all that stuff yeah. and all that repression so that I could use it as, as an artist. Because what, when I got into acting, I, what I could connect with very easily was anger. Because okay. it's so much anger and fucking rage in me, yeah. I could have killed somebody. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, I, but my teacher said, you have to now show the other side of you, the vulnerability. You know what I mean? And all the great actors have both of that. You know what I mean? When you have all that, but you have the softness. Mm. And then I had to do that and deconstruct myself. And, and, and that, in order to do that, you have to talk about the stuff that you've repressed and you have to open up. Yeah. You start opening up, then you, have, you show the vulnerability. And vulnerability is very attractive and people love vulnerability and you love that sort of honesty. Yeah. And it makes them feel good yeah. and it inspires others to be vulnerable too, you know what I mean? Absolutely. So, yeah. it's very important. Jesus, <laughs> that is a very powerful one. Yeah. Um, that is very powerful because, again, it's something that I've personally struggled with. Mm. Being that vulnerable at times. Would that be coming from your background? Is that a part of it too? Like yeah. me, yeah. with the African background, because yeah. my vi and I could be way off, but African yeah. men 
yeah. very masculine man. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, look at Blake over here. He's a very <laughs> masculine man. Yeah. Muscular man. And you see, yeah, you see that warrior. Like, yeah. I'll give he, you an example. Yeah. It, it's something, see, parents in, in my community, they, they run away from, I think any parent, they run away from failing their child. Yeah. So, in us it's different, but I'll give you an example. I want, um, when I was growing up, at the age of 18, I wanted to I contemplate a suicide. Yeah. And I nearly done it too. I was down at Houston Station for three nights in a row, um, nearly about to jump off the cliff into the Liffey. Um, I was a few steps away from doing it, but thank God I didn't. Something pulled thank me back. God. I think that image of my family, that image of my brother, the effects that I would have on him, th those are the things that I seen at that time. But a couple of years later, when I did have that conversation with a close family member, and I mentioned it to them and I was like, because of certain situations that happened that you were involved with, um, that you p played a part in or you may have not, but this is where I was at this age and this is what I contemplated. Their response was, but that wasn't my fault. You know what I mean? It was like, and now when I look back at it now, at the time I took it differently, but now when I look back, I understand it's just, even, there's a lack of understanding, there's a lack of education, there's mm. a lack of information in my community mm. and in a lot of communities out there and a lot of families and homes. Yeah. There's a lack of understanding and information. So when you don't understand the importance of being vulnerable and parents just, they, they, they want to be like, I'm perfect. It's not my fault that my child failed. They want to take credit for the good things, but not the bad. <laughs> so it's not addressed. And in my culture, yeah, you have to be looked at as a manly man. Yeah. Growing up even, like, you know what I mean? If you cried, the kid who cried, everybody considered them as a, as a wimp. Yeah. And you'd probably get bullied. So yeah. if you show weakness, you get bullied. You're, Same. you're meant to be tough all the time. But it's then... What happened for me was it's an explosion of emotions because I'm trying to be strong, but inside I'm broken. Well, what is said becomes a symptom. There Goes you back go. to that. And trauma came to collect with trauma me. Trauma came to collect, yeah. It came to collect. It's um, very real. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's the thing is because it's, people look at it too much in a literal sense because we can't see depression, we can't see symptoms of, you know what I mean? Yeah. We can't see them directly. Mm. But whenever you see an angry person, you can you can guarantee that's trauma. Yeah. You can guarantee that's repression. Yeah. When you see someone exploding with anger, doing silly stuff, you see someone taking a chance that they don't that they shouldn't be taking yeah. or taking a stupid risk yeah. and putting themselves or others in danger. You can guarantee that's trauma. Yeah. You can guarantee that's anger. You can guarantee that's repression. Like true. You know what I mean? And uh, it's uh, we need a cultural shift. Yeah. Is what we need in this country. Like we need a cultural shift everywhere in the world. Like. This is why Jordan Peterson is so popular, yeah. is because men out there can relate to what he's saying and his yeah. message that he is given is empowering them. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's why he is so successful and others like him. Yeah, that's exactly it. But I think a thing as well that helped me when I was going through that stage was writing. Yeah. Um, English, English class, writing stories and writing. I think I, I was asked to write about a poem and what a poem represented for me. Mm. And the poem I chose was uh, Invictus by William, William Hernsley, I think his name is. Because I watched the movie Invictus by Nelson Man, the Nelson Man film. by Morgan Freeman. Yeah, Clint Eastwood directed yeah. Matt Damon. And it's yeah. the poem in that, yeah. um, out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. And each verse of that poem meant a different stage of my life that I went through pain. Right. And when I was in English class, I was told to write about that. It was the separation of my parents. It was the time that I contemplated suicide. It was the times that I thought I was failing in life and things like that. Yeah. And by writing out my pain, I essentially left it within that. Yeah. Now, I never found that they corrected it and stuff like that, but That's I never got man. a copy of it. But it's things like that when you do find that creative outlet to release it. Ah, man, it's amazing. It's a different but, class. But cre what did I hear recently? Uh, it was, boy, I think it was on Nietzsche, yeah. the, the great kind of philosopher. He said that um, that art, art um, is a distraction from the curse of reality. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I was like, fucking hell, that's what it is like. It's powerful. It's so powerful. Yeah. Creativity, what it does for people, and it allows them to have a vehicle to fucking, to drive somewhere, yeah. and to jump in and fucking, and, and, and express all of that, all the stuff that actually hurt them being able to use that as an advantage yeah. uh, and, and it comes out in beautiful stuff and stuff that changes the world, you mm. know what I mean? That's, that's amazing. Yeah. But I think the trauma thing, it goes back and you inherit, you inherit a life script from your family, from where Very you come true. from, you know what I mean? And there's trauma everywhere and this, this country is full of trauma. Fucking Congo, the Congo, that's yeah. fucking, as we were talking about yeah. earlier, King Leopold and the tens of millions of people he slaughtered and limbs yeah. cut and all, imagine all that trauma that he created in your land. Yeah. 
that people are still dealing with to this day. Still present. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. and how it changed the whole trajectory of the Congo. Like Ireland was through colonialism, like Nigeria was through yeah. colonialism by the British. This is all pain and trauma that we haven't dealt with. Like, yeah. there's so many post-colonial effects, you know, that people uh, people don't even realise. And you see it big time in Ireland. You see it in alcohol massively. You know what yeah. I mean? How we deal with with all with all those things is alcohol and just ah, let's go to the pub and. Yeah, we'll yeah. just yeah, we'll, we'll swallow for fifteen pints and then we'll have a hug. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> but we couldn't do it sober. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's just how we, it's all about how we deal with trauma and how we how we look how we look at it, and um, or how we don't at all. You know, and that's the difference. Yeah. And this is fantastic. Like John, honestly, I want to thank you for coming on and sharing this type of information, um, because it's one thing hearing it from somebody who's successful. It's another thing hearing it also and having a conversation from your background coming up as a traveler and experience of those things because it's things that we don't see yeah. and I can guarantee you that there's young travelers out there even older travelers that are going through similar situations um, and this type of conversation I find is more educating than any other conversation yeah um, well we're speaking from personal experience exactly you know what I mean like and having with knowledge both well. of us yeah. with knowledge yeah. but that is knowledge the personal experience and having overcome that yeah I mean we're we're perfect case studies rather than someone talking theory. Yeah. About what if someone went through this and blah, blah, blah. Well, yeah. I went through that and I came out the other side and so did you. Yeah. And I think people need to see that. They need to see the success stories. Yeah. And they need to see that it's possible to get through that. Especially now with the age of social media and all, like, you know, social media is designed to get you addicted. Mm. You get a dopamine hit every time you get a like. Yeah. You know, psychotherapists created these yeah. systems, cognitive scientists and all that stuff. And you go, you look at what they're falling into and being addicted to all that stuff uh, and 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 find it like years ago we'd go we'd we'd walk around Darndell and you'd be walking around Darndell looking for girls you know yeah. and you'd be going to a corner and you go what's up you meet me all this you know <laughs> but there was that lovely connection yeah but now instead of like walking up to a group of people at the wall now they're in a WhatsApp group DM. Do you know what I mean like and it's like there's no fucking connection here and yeah. they don't know because this is what they're brought up in like my niece and my nephews come to me and they go for Wi-Fi codes <laughs> I go get out there and play now. <laughs> And I'd bring them out playing, or I'd bring them to the park, no yeah. problem, get them out doing something active. You know what I mean? So we're, we have a whole generation addicted to social media. We will not mm. know the ramifications of social media and how it has affected us for many years ago. And there yeah. has been early, early, um, early studies already yeah. and connected to, to anxiety and all that. But the next generation need to go, they need to take things back to nature a bit, yeah. you know? Brilliant. So with that being said, we're coming to the end of this interview. Uh, this conversation with John, absolutely refreshing. Thanks for um, having me, man. Um, I'm, I was expecting great content, but mm. this is absolutely incredible. Um, I suppose any sort of closing words for anybody who's going to be watching this um, on the back of this, be very much appreciated. Meaning, purpose, passion. That's nice. it. Perfect. No better way to sum it up, guys. Whoever's watching this, you've watched it, you've heard the content that's being delivered by John. Uh, where can people find you as well? Just to plug yourself there John Connors yeah. actor on Instagram that's <laughs> where sure. that's really yeah everybody will very know. simple yeah put it in on Google you'll yeah. see yeah. Um, but honestly John thank you so much for coming thanks on. for having me man I appreciate uh, it good conversation thank you yeah. likewise so that's it guys thank you so much make sure to subscribe to our channel the links are below here also follow us on our Instagram and all our social media platforms as well where we will be releasing new updates, short snippets of different interviews every single week and key content on helping you get through today. Thank you.